Hi, Learning Theories and Application students. We're going to take a look at Chapter 8, The Biological Basis of Learning and Memory, but I'm going to take a little bit different approach to this chapter. Rather than going through and sort of reviewing and explaining and expanding on the content that's in the chapter, I'm going to give you some information that you need to make sense of the chapter. I think that there's an assumption of understanding of neuroanatomy in this chapter that probably folks don't have, and I don't expect you to learn a lot of neuroanatomy, but I want you to understand some basic things so that what they're talking about in the textbook makes sense. Okay. First thing we need to do is look at the parts and the functions of a neuron. So a neuron is comprised of a cell body primarily. Okay, This is the cell body, this large piece. In the cell body there's a nucleus. Okay, And coming off of the cell body are several different structures. There are dendrites. These are the dendrites. They come directly off the cell body. They're small. Um, they have a lot of little branches. And these little branches are used to make connections to other neurons. And there's also an axon that comes off the cell body. This dark thing that you can only see pieces of is the axon, and it actually runs from this cell body all the way along out here to the end. Okay? And at the end of the axon, there's axon terminals. Again, little hair-like projections that allow this neuron to connect with another neuron. So we've got a cell body with a nucleus, with dendrites that allow connections to other neurons, and they're small, and a larger, longer piece that's the axon that has axon terminals that also then connect to other um, cell, uh, other neurons. Okay, We have the Schwann cell, or these little dots, and the Schwann cells are used in the transmission of impulses from along the nerve, and they also are used to create myelin sheath. These little white bubbles are actually fatty insulating cells that form along the axon that helps spread the transmission of nerve impulses along the axon more quickly. I'll tell you how that works in just a second. And the last thing we need to define then is the space between the myelin. And remember right here we've got an axon that's going between them, but there's the space is referred to as the node of Ranvier. Okay, so what does a neuron do? A, the nerve cells in your brain rather. Um, conduct information from one part from one part of your brain to the next. So we use this to allow information to travel around your brain. It's kind of the highway system of the brain. And an impulse will generate somewhere um, and it starts you know somewhere in your brain on this cell body and then that nerve impulse has to travel all the way down here, ends here, this connects to another nerve and it goes to the next nerve and so on, next neuron and so on. Well as this impulse travels it would have to go all the way along the axon except for this myelin sheath and the myelin is an insulator and it allows the nerve impulse to travel faster because now instead of going from going all the way the length of this it can jump from one node to the next. It can go boom, boom, boom like this all the way down until it gets to the end and that makes the traveling makes it travel a lot faster. And we have some evidence of this um, rapid r speeding up of transmission of nerve impulses because babies are sort of uncoordinated. You know, babies can't hold their heads up when they start grabbing for things. They whole fistedly grab. Well, babies also don't have a lot of myelin. Their myelin, their, their neurons, their axons are unmyelinated when they're born and the myelin builds up and develops and as that myelin increases, we also see an increase in motor control and in coordination. All right, so I told you that the axons connect, the axon terminals connect to dendrites of other neurons. Let's take a look at what happens at that connection. Remember we said we have a nerve impulse that comes down here, comes out here, connects to another neuron. Let's take a look at what happens at that connection. So this nerve impulse has traveled all the way down this nerve. It's coming down the axon. It's going to get here to the end of the axon at the axon terminals. And when it gets here, when that little electrical current gets there, it stimulates this axon to release a neurotransmitter. And a neurotransmitter is just a chemical that tells the neuron what to do. And there's all different types of chemicals, different neurotransmitters in different parts of the brain, different parts of the body. We're not going to deal with types of neurotransmitters at this point. We're just going to acknowledge that they exist. When this electrical impulse gets here, it says, OK, release the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter goes out in this gap, the gap between the axon and the dendrite of the receiving neuron. This gap is called a synapse. They don't actually touch. There's a gap. Neurotransmitter goes into the gap, comes into receptors on the dendrite, and then this neurotransmitter stimulates this next neuron to send an electrical impulse. Okay, so that's how we conduct impulses along the neurons. This is just some images of interconnected neurons. These are actually stained um, photographs taken with 
different types of equipment. But you can see here the cell body, and you can see axons coming off of this cell body. You can see little dendrites here connecting to other axons, all right? And you can see the same thing up here, cell bodies, connections. And you see how they're all interconnected, and it's kind of a mess. It's a big, tangly mess. That's because we have lots of connections to lots of different parts of our brain, and we want that big, tangly mess. It's really not tangly, um, because that allows us to communicate to, for information to communicate quickly from one part of the brain to the next. So these neurons are all interconnected and there's probably about 12 billion neurons in your brain with about 5,000 synapses and you can see that there's multiple neurons coming into one synapse. So there's a lot of things connecting at one point. You've got one, two, probably three, maybe four all connecting here. That's why there aren't necessarily as many synapses as there are neurons. Let's look at your brain for a minute. Let's do some brain anatomy so that you understand the basic parts of the brain. This is the left side of the brain. <clears throat> so if you, this, your eyes would be right around here, okay? And the brain stem is back here at the back of the brain, the base of your neck. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at the different parts of the brain. First thing we have is the frontal lobe. This is the front part of the brain, not the very front, but in the front part of the brain, and this is important for paying attention on cue, for paying attention in general, and paying attention when we say, look, pay attention, someone calls your name. The prefrontal area is the part in front of the frontal area, it's the very front part of your brain, and it's important for planning complex cognitive behavior. So this is the part that allows you to do difficult thinking. It's also implicated in personality, decision making, and moderate, moderating social behavior. So this part of the brain is one of the late ones to develop and late part of the brain to develop and we see that even in adolescence this is not fully developed which may be why adolescents have some trouble making decisions and maybe don't always behave properly in certain contexts. Okay. Broca's area is part this little dark spot right here see the dark spot it, at, in the prefrontal area and it's important for speech production and language processing and it will be referred to in your chapter. You've got the temporal lobe, which is this yellow area, all right, and that's kind of at the side of your head, kind of your, your ear would be sticking out right about here, okay? And it's important for sensory input, so it's important for um, touch, smell, taste, all your sensory input. Also auditory perception, making sense of what you hear, for language and speech production, and for memory. And the hippocampus, which is a little tiny structure that we'll look at in a little while, is located way deep inside the temporal lobe. Um, Wernicke's area is right here. That's the darker part of the yellow temporal lobe. And Wernicke's area is particularly important for language comprehension, interpretation, and recognition. And if somebody has a stroke that attack, uh, um, would have hit Wernicke's area, they'd have a hard time understanding language. They might be able to talk, but they wouldn't understand what you were saying to them. Okay. Whereas if a stroke impacted Broca's area, somebody would understand what you were saying, but they wouldn't be able to speak back to you. This is the occipital lobe in the very back of your brain and the part that sort of sticks out on the back of your head and it's important for visual perception and color recognition. The parietal lobe is just above the occipital lobe. It's important for organizing attention, for stimulus differentiation and procedural memory. What we mean by stimulus differentiation is telling one thing from a different thing, knowing that this is a P and this is an L. Okay being able to see the differences there, that stimulus differentiation, and procedural memory is knowledge of how to do procedural things, knowledge of how to tie your shoe, for example, or ride a bike, and so parietal lobe is very important for that. And then we also have the sensory motor area up here, which is this blue part and this red part, and sensory input comes in here that is related to motor control, and then motor control originates in the sensory motor area. So we have to have sensory input to tell us where we are in space, if our foot is touching the floor, if, we have a, if we're, our foot is on the step when we anticipate it. Have you ever tried to walk up steps and they were either steeper or less steep than you thought, or rather the rise is higher or less than you thought, and you, so you either slam your foot down quickly on the step or you almost trip because you weren't expecting it to be quite that high. Well, that awareness of where you are in space, that sensory input comes into the sensory motor area. So these are the basic parts of the brain, and your textbook refers to many of these different areas because of the impact they have on learning. So the frontal lobe, right, is important for attention, so is the parietal lobe. So if somebody has problems with attention, 
they might have problems in either the frontal or parietal lobe. And both of those parts are very important when we talk about paying attention for learning. Prefrontal area is important for complex cognitive behavior. If we want to understand somebody's speech and language, we're going to have to look back here at Broca's area, temporal lobe, Wernicke's area. And your book will talk about some different research on these areas and how they relate to learning. A couple of other things that you need to be aware of or you need to know um, that your book assumes you understand is something called the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is this dark purple stain. It's this whole, all these little ridges, and that is the outer layer of the brain. Well, if it's the outer layer, why does it have these little dips here? So let's go back for just a minute. See this brain? Whoops, back one more. See the brain and how it has all these little wrinkly things in it? These little lines here are actually where the cerebral cortex folds in, in these bumpy spaces on the brain. So go back here now, go to the next one. So this would be the surface of the brain, and then there's a fold, that's one of the lines, and you can see the cerebral cortex goes all along this fold, okay? <clears throat> and then your text also will talk about the corpus callosum, which is this white part here, and the corpus callosum is a thick network of fibers that connects one half of the brain to the next. You see this is a hemisphere, or a half of the brain, and we have a right and a left hemisphere, and they are connected, they communicate with each other from the cor via the corpus callosum. Otherwise, they would be two separate halves, but this allows them to connect one to the other. All right, the last thing we want to talk about is the hippocampus, and it's a teeny tiny little structure deep inside the temporal lobe, and it is shaped like a seahorse, and that's what I had a picture of that I forgot to put in here. But this, the hippocampus is also important for selective attention. Your, your text also references brain imaging as one of our sources of information about how the brain works. And one type of brain imaging is PET scans. And this particular um, slide shows the PET scan for somebody with bipolar disorder. And it shows you how different parts of the brain are activated. So here's the bipolar patient in a, de in a depressed state. And the frontal lobe of the brain doesn't have much activity. And remember, that's the part related to emotion. And the, when the lobes of the brain aren't very active, it causes depressed mood and a lack of motivation. Increased activity in the frontal lobes cause increased activity or agitation. And so you can see that here, it's the occipital and the parietal lobe that are being stimulated. And up here, you can see more stimulation in the frontal lobe. And the red indicates the stimulation. So then we talk about brain imaging. We're talking about taking pictures of the activity in the brain. All right, I hope that gives you a little bit of an orientation to your brain and your nervous system and use that to help understand the research that's been done to understand the biological basis of learning.